Hi, welcome to the walkthrough for the Indoor Growing with Hydroponics presentation originally presented at the Mother Earth News Fair uh, in 2020, Belton, Texas. And we will get rid of that little bubble down there that we don't need to see. So let's start off with what is hydroponics? What does that even mean? Let's geek out a little bit on the word first um, and, and go into the root word so that we, we don't use the word and think it means something it doesn't mean, to quote an old movie. Um, hydro is a combining form representing hydrogen and compound words, denoting especially a combination of hydrogen with some negative element or radical, in this case oxygen, expressed as H2O. Okay, Jack, just, just say water. So we're talking about water here. But what does ponic mean? I mean, we throw around words like hydroponics, aquaponics all the time. And I, I think most people don't really know what the word ponic means. Ponic comes from Greek, and it means to labor or to toil. And what it literally means when we say hydroponics is water working. That's actually what the word means. And I personally consider hydroponics water-based horticulture. And I want to talk a little bit before we move from this slide on what horticulture is. Because we're really big on the word agriculture in our society. Agriculture means the culture of fields. So agriculture does not really pertain to directly plants. It is the culture of fields. And in that, in that culturing of field, we grow plants generally in a monoculture. Horticulture is the culture of plants. And it is far more ancient a practice in how humans interact with their world than agriculture. We, we are far more a horticultural species, in my opinion, than we are an agricultural one. That's why lots of people have gardens, just, just to, to make it simple. Also, I want to say, even though we're going to be talking about a very specific type of hydroponics today, and specifically going more toward the indoor side of hydroponics, to me, if there is water we are using in the system, there is water working. Everything that we do as a horticulturist, in some level, is hydroponic. Because if you think about it, if I have plants growing in a container or the ground or whatever, I have basically a few things. I have an inert material, some sort of physical material, uh, dirt, rock, gravel, something like that. I have some sort of nutrient available to the plants. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium are the big ones, but there's a whole group of secondary and, and micronutrients that plants need to survive. So I have this, this inert material, and yet generally if I'm growing in soil, it's a carrier for these nutrients. And then I have water. And, and if I'm going to grow a plant in the ground, I need those three things. Well, if I take away the nutrient from the ground-based system, the plants won't grow. And if I take away the water from the ground-based system, the plants won't grow. But I can take away the, the physical material and use water and nutrient, and as long as there's sufficient oxygen for the plants, the plants will grow. So to me, whenever we move to something that is dominated by water, we are doing some sort of hydroponics. I even consider aquaponics a type of hydroponics because there's water working. Let's talk about the advantages of hydroponics. Number one, it's naturally highly automated. I love automation. Automation is great. Since we're moving water around, in most systems anyway, we have an automation component to the system. When I go away, my aquaponics or my hydroponic system, as long as nothing breaks, there's nothing to be done while I'm away, other than maybe whoever's watching my place might do a little harvesting. Uh, they're low maintenance. There's not a lot to be done in a well-designed system. They're low energy input. I mean, oh, there's, there's, there's a, a pump. We can run a, a, a two-acre greenhouse on a one-and-a-half horsepower pump because almost everything, once we throw that water somewhere, is done by gravity coming back. And as you'll see in some of the systems that we put together, we don't even need to run that pump all the time. We might run that pump six hours a day, spread out over every other hour for 15 minutes, for instance. Um, there's low uh, energy inputs, as I said. There's an inc incredible rate of growth in all hydro systems, aquaponic systems, etc., cetera, uh, with fast turnover for the crops that are ideally suited. In this case, you see mostly lettuce and herbs, and that's one of the best things to grow. We can plant at very, very high density, and we can do that because we bring everything the plants need right to the plants, and as the plants are small, we actually have systems, uh, much like the ones you're looking at here, where these rails can actually move 
across a system and they, they get further apart as the plants get bigger. So we can go incredibly high density when the plants are young, where if you're in a soil-based system, you can't really move things around like that. Um, we can use less water. It was hydro, right? So it's not like it's all water. But they use actually a lot less water than soil-based systems. The plants actually don't use less water. Let me explain that real quick. The plants use the same amount of water. But we use less water to get the same amount of water to the plants because none of it goes away. Because plants actually need the water so that they can absorb CO2 and do their thing. Asking a plant to use less water itself would be like asking you to use less oxygen. So the plants use the same amount of water, but we use less water to grow the plants. We definitely use less fertilizer. We use almost no insecticide. And we have zero fertilizer runoff with a hydroponic system. Now, what some people will say is, well, some of these big hydro operations, they put the water into the sewer system. Yeah, they put nutrient-dense water into the sewage system. But, you know, in modern society, that it's not that there's no problems with sewage systems, but that water's not, like, dumped out in the ocean. They're, they're put into systems that have treatment plants to deal with lots of nutrient, like the stuff you flush down the toilet every day. I would say the average household in America produces a lot more nutrient waste than what a greenhouse does, let's say a big greenhouse, a commercial greenhouse, an acre produces. On top of that, we have technologies, and they're being used more and more, that close the loop and reuse the nutrient. And in home systems, there's lots of options we'll talk about. But there's no runoff, which is one of the biggest environmental problems that we have. And it can be adapted to any environment, climate, lifestyle, diet. We can really use hydro for just about anything. Let's talk about the disadvantages. I do not believe there is anything in the world that we can do that has 100% advantage and no downside. That's, that's the, and it's, it's, it's BS to say otherwise, and you'll see what problems that creates here in a bit. Uh, number one, initial startup costs can be high because it's a lot of infrastructure initially. Now, if we design it, for longevity, that cost pays itself back and then becomes irrelevant to a long-term system. But that initial cost can be high. It does require some specialized knowledge. It's not real hard, but it's, I wouldn't even say specialized. It's differential knowledge. So gardening requires specialized knowledge, but it's something that's pretty well understood. And it's, it's pretty, I think it's ingrained in us as the horticultural species we are. We put this the seed into the soil. And we can do all the soil tests we want, but the reality is when you look at good soil, you know it. I can show you two handfuls of soil and you can pick out the one that's probably better. Not every time, but most of the time. We know what good soil feels like and smells like. It's intrinsic to our nature. Um, good hydroponic water looks exactly like bad hydroponic water. So it, we do have to learn about nutrient and balancing and pH and things like that. The fluid must be changed and disposed of. Now, while it doesn't have to be the environmental crisis some people make it out to be, it is, it is a chore. It is something that has to be dealt with. It's very difficult to be truly organic at the present time with hydroponics, though I have a way that it could be done that's not that hard. But it's not what anybody's actually doing yet. It does usually require electricity and the systems that don't have their own trade-offs. And it has a certain stigma. Though, I don't think the stigma is a well-earned one. I want to actually talk about that stigma as we move on here. Um, and I chose this picture because I think this typifies the stigma that can come up. Number one, I think the anti-hydroponic stigma is built by, number one, a lack of knowledge, which we can simply call ignorance. There's a lot of things that people don't know about hydroponics, or they assume about hydroponics that are wrong, that are simply based in ignorance. And ignorance is not a negative. It's the absence of knowledge. That's all that it is. You should never fear anybody curing your ignorance. I know I never do. And there's many things I'm ignorant to. How to build a rocket ship to go to the planet Pluto. I am completely and wholly ignorant of how to do that. Right? So we need to cure our ignorance. But then we also have something else. Intentional misinformation. Deni that's a nice way of saying lies. And I think that probably the biggest objectionists that there are to hydroponics right now are soil-based, generally organic or beyond organic, small producers that are farming somewhere between, you know, a tenth of an acre market garden up to a couple acres. And most of those producers are producing high-value, leafy green crops with fast turnover, 
Guess what we're producing with hydroponics? Mostly the same thing. And the things that they're producing other than those crops, peppers, tomatoes, eggplants, cucumbers, that type of thing. Guess what the second best thing to produce? So I think there is some almost like the elevator operators were probably not really thrilled about automated elevators back when there were a lot of people that were employed as elevator operators. But I think this is different. Like the elevator operators clearly were going to go out of, they just not be important anymore. They're gone. We're never going to get rid of dirt farming. But I think that some dirt farmers may feel directly threatened, and, and justifiably so, because a large organization can move into a, 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 an urban area, put in a few greenhouses, and produce way more, way faster for less money with equal or better quality to the actual food delivered to the customer. And that creates an environment where there is some lies, just straight up lies told. Uh, one example would be that hydroponics is a sterile system. Uh, the beneficial fungi and bacterial um, uh, pro populations in a well-balanced hydro system are equal, almost equivalent exactly to a well-run well soil-based system. There's nothing sterile about them. Um, I've had, in my hydro systems running synthetic nutrient, worms appear and live in the roots of my plants. So, uh, Long-distance producers are another source of the stigma. We call that crappy varieties. Uh, this picture here of tomatoes, if you're growing tomatoes that are designed to go in a box and transport across the country, you're growing bad-tasting, poor-tasting tomatoes. So people will say, well, I had hydroponic tomatoes, and they tasted like cardboard. You mean like most of the tomatoes at the grocery store? So if we're growing you know, a, a black cherry tomato or a, a black crim or some other really great variety of tomato, they taste fantastic as do the greens, as does the basil, etc. And then overselling by zealots. We call that bullshit. There's plenty of people out there saying, like, hydroponics is going to save the planet. Hydroponics is an arrow in a quiver that solves a lot of problems. It is a solution. It's not the solution. And there's people promising that hydro can do things that it just can't do. And that creates stigma as well. So we need to balance that to really understand it. Now, let's look at growing indoors where this stuff all gets turbocharged. Why grow indoors? Number one, zero pest problems. Now, that's not 100% true, but it can be. The right systems grown indoors with the right environmental controls, pests literally can't get in. There, there's systems that are running you know, negative pressure systems the way that hospitals keep a disease in or out of an area. So in that situation, you really do have zero. But you either have zero or very low pest problems. You have total environmental control that gives you predictable results. And with vertical systems, we can achieve 9 to 20x yields over field-grown crops. We can actually do better than that. We can do 7 to 9 times yields in basic greenhouse systems. So vertical systems can just take that and run with it from there on up. Um, there are some disadvantages. Number one. Initial and ongoing lighting expense. We have to buy the lights, and then we have to pay to run them. And it, it does add up to a significant energy usage. Uh, there's a, a, a cost of that environmental control. It's great that we can keep our planet exactly 82.3 degrees, if that's the temperature we want it at. But there's a cost of doing that. There's a cost to the structure. Now, a lot of companies now are retrofitting older buildings that have been abandoned and things like that, so it's a relatively low cost. But that always has challenges too, because the best run structures are built purpose, you know, purpose built to what they're doing. That can be extremely expensive and make this completely um, undoable from an economic standpoint. Like unless it's billionaires doing it for spite, it, it, it makes it not doable if we don't really think about how we do it. And it can be very labor intensive if it's not designed well. And the reason I chose this picture with this guy that looks like he's in a hospital on a scissor lift is I've done a lot of research on this, and the number one thing that vertical farmers who have gone out of business have said has destroyed their business is the scissor lift. If you've ever used a scissor lift, you know that when you need one, nothing else will really do the job, and whatever you're doing is going to take 9 to 10 times longer than it normally would. So if you ever decide you want to go big scale with this, we need to design the scissor lift out of large vertical systems, even ones that are this big. The best design systems now use automation that actually move the plants up and down in some sort of a rotation uh, that actually allows the plant to be very, very high density when it's first planted 
and it brings it back around to the other side at harvest point. And that means that all these systems need to only move a very small amount every day. And we have basically, if in, in a huge system, we might be planting 60,000 plants and harvesting 60,000 plants every day. And each only needs to move one layer each day. And then as it comes down the back side of some of these systems, again, just like the greenhouse earlier, those things begin to spread out through automation. Then you have very, very low labor use. But again, it's very expensive. It's very expensive to set up a system like that. But home scale systems solve all those issues. First of all, lights are cheap. I use lights from a company called Barina. They're amazing. They have incredible growth. You can see right here, these are plants that were grown with the Barina lights. You're talking lights that for a two-foot light come out to about $2 a piece. So I, on a shelf, the system that, that grew this plant, these plants here, I'm using three. You could get away with two, but I'm using three. So you get 30 bucks a shelf for about a two-foot by two-foot shelf. Uh, the energy audit is an easy win. You know, you're talking about 24-watt lights. And when you look at the cost of electricity versus how much production you get how fast, you, you win the energy audit every time. You, you can pay back the not just the money, but the energy as far as the nutrition that you're producing. You already have a structure. We call them houses. And you already heat and cool your home. Most people keep their home somewhere between 68 and 74 degrees. You know what? Plants love that temperature. Some people in the summer, they keep their house up around 80 degrees because they don't want to pay a big electric bill. You know what? Plants love 80 degrees. Some people let their temperature go down in the, in the, the mid-60s in the winter because they're willing to deal with it. They don't, you know what? Plants are fine, especially if we pick the right varieties. So when we're looking at home-scale indoor hydroponics, all of, as long as we're mindful about what we do, all of the problems that plague commercial vertical farming just go away. Um, and I want to cover the four most common hobbyist techniques. And most people are going to end up using more than one of these. They're going to use combinations. They're going to use other techniques. But these are the four things that people generally start with one or more of. They are Kratky. We call that uh, non-recirculating hydroponics. There's no pump. And we'll talk about exactly how all these work here in a second. Then there's what's known as NFT or nutrient film technique. This is the most popular system used in commercial hydroponics. So a lot of people are like, if the commercial guys use it, I want to use it. You probably eventually do, but you probably don't want to start there. We'll explain that in a second. Then we have deep water recirculating. It's exactly what it sounds like. We're growing plants primarily in water that's deep relative to these other systems anyway. And the water circulates. And then we have ebb and flow, which means water comes in and water goes out. So that's, that's pretty much everything as, as we go there. Now, um, again, most people end up using combinations of these. I want to start out with nutrient film technique. Because again, this is it's very, very attractive when you're looking at, I want to grow a lot of food in a small space. It really lends itself to vertical production. And it really lends itself to producing a lot in a small space. If you look at the A-frame uh, using the nutrient film technique here, you can see how much uh, this grower is growing in an area that's probably about 3 foot wide by about 12 foot long or 10 foot long. Um, here's the good, good, good of it. Low water and nutrient use. What we're doing in this system is, if you look, you see the, the lines that are delivering the fluid here, right? So we have these lines like this. And they deliver a very small amount of fluid that flows through these channels. These look like they're actually made out of a nylon fence posts, which, you know, they're designed to last 25 years in the sun. So they're very, very long, long-lasting systems. Um, and they just take a very small amount of, of fluid across the bottom of those roots. And so there's a, relative to how much you're growing, it's a very small amount of fluid that you have to deal with for fluid changes. Uh, so that makes water changes fast and easy. It's modular design for expansion. So if I want to do more, I just keep plugging in more. It's easy to clean and disinfect. If we design this so these rails are easy to just lift, you know, disconnect your, your tube and lift this rail off, when we're harvesting, we can actually just take the whole rail to a harvesting table and harvest. And if we want to clean it out before we replant it, it's really easy to spray it out with some sort of disinfectant or what have you and get it all ready to go again. Because the water's always moving, and it has to be in these systems, there's no salt buildup in the root zones. There's no buildup of any uh, icky gick in the root zones. There, but there, here's the downsides. One, there's limited root mass space. There's only so much room for the roots in these systems. 
Uh, number two, the fluid is subject to temperature change. Think about taking a garden hose in the sun in the summer. And when you turn it on, the water comes out really, really hot. But after it flushes all the water out, it's nice and cool. But what happens if you turn that water down to it's a really slow trickle through that hose? Even though the water's coming out of the ground at, let's say, 65 degrees, it's going to be pretty hot by the time it comes out the other end if we're moving it through there slowly. The longer the hose and the bigger the hose relative to the amount of fluid going through, the quicker we get that change. So people put these in greenhouses and what have you, and they end up burning their plants up. Or it gets really cold really fast, too. Where if we have a larger mass of water, water's a great thermal battery. It's hard to move the temperature of that water by very much. Um, next, it's not good at all for long-duration crops. We do not want to grow tomatoes, cucumbers, watermelons, uh, eggplants, peppers, any of the kind of second-tier crops that actually work really good in hydro in these systems. And I'm going to tell you this. It causes the most grief for hobbyists. The most videos, articles, write-ups, pictures on Facebook, etc. I see where something bad happened are from people that, w that started with NFT. It's not bad. It just requires more effort, and it's probably not the best place to start for most people. Kratky. Kratky is what I call simple, effective, and limited. A PhD named Dr. Kratky from the University of Hawaii came up with this, this system. There's no pump needed. It will work one way or another for almost everything. The root systems are amazing. Their downside is there's a lot of fluid to change, and it may not be as productive as some other systems. To drive home how well this works, though, the tomatoes you see me holding in, in, in this picture, okay, the tomatoes in this picture are 25 days from seed. Not 25 days from transplant, 25 days from seed. Uh, they were grown in a crack key system I'm going to show you in just a little bit here that is designed as a seed starting system to get plants up to size like this so that they can then be planted in the ground. Um, as you'll see later, I mean, part of the problem is it almost works too well. You have to think about your timing a little differently than a typical seed starting system. But man, the growth, look at the, the, the thickness of the stalks. Now, to be fair, this is a very aggressive tomato. It has a really high rate of growth. It's called uh, Matt's Wild Cherry. It's also known as Texas Wild Cherry. But still, I've never seen anything grow like this ever. The issue with Kratky, since it's non-recirculating, is we need a significant amount of fluid. And the reason that it works is when we grow stuff in hydroponics, the reason you always have pumps, the main reason, is oxygen. So if a plant just sits in water, Eventually, it will take all the oxygen out of that water. C dissolved CO2 will go really, really high, and you'll have problems with the roots and the plants will die. With Kratky, what we do is we simply suspend that plant, and as the water evaporates, we form an air gap. And the plant can get all of the air it wants, in that, oh, all, the, all the oxygen it wants in that air gap. And that's why these roots do this, because number one, they're chasing the fluid down, but you get a lot of humidity. The roots actually wick up moisture. What I found is my, my grow media, even when the water is now below the net cup, my grow media or grow sponges stay damp. I was, it really surprised me that that happened. And then I thought about it. The water actually is wicking up through the root system. So Kratky works really, really well for what it does. But then we end up with a significant amount of fluid we have to get rid of. And we have no pump to get rid of it. So one of the ways that we can solve that issue is we can put things like bulkheads with valves into Kratky systems if they're larger so we can drain them instead of having to dump them or pump them or scoop them. Next, deep water hydro. Deep water hydro to me is the most forgiving form of hydroponics you can do. It's extremely forgiving because if we do it right, it's basically Kratky with a pump. And so the way we do that is we, we actually set the water level down far enough from the grow medium in the plant that there is an air gap. So what happens if the pump dies? You're at Kratky now until you fix the pump. So if you're out of town for five days, your pump, it, worst case scenario, your pump dies an hour after you leave your driveway. Your plants are still alive when you get home. If we design it that way. Now, we either do that because we're transplanting plants into the system 
and we wait till they're big enough to have an air gap. Or we have a system where we can lower the level, which is really easy to do. And once the plants get to a certain size, we drop the level down and we keep the recirculation going. Um, it uses minimal media because we, we're growing in water. So in this case, you see these tomatoes, they're growing in leca or expanded clay pebbles. And it, so, yeah, they're growing in some media, but it's a very small amount of media. It's just for structural support. The plants are growing mostly in water, so that reduces the expense of media. We can grow almost anything in deep water hydro. What sold me on it was having a guest on my show who explained how he was growing cannabis, high-end high expensive medical cannabis in deep water systems. And I'm like, well, if you can grow cannabis in it, you can grow any. You can definitely grow a tomato. Um, downside, it requires a pump. By its very nature, we need to move water. If it's not Kratky, we're moving water. Uh, it uses a lot of fluid, just like Kratky does, so that requires significant fluid changes, and it may need significant trellising and supports and things like that for your larger plants. And containers might be expensive, depending on what you're using. These are specialized containers, but you know, uh, Commander Series, and there's other ones, the black and yellow Tupperware things that you get at like Home Depot and Lowe's, the five-gallon bucket versions of those that work great for this, they're like five bucks a piece. So it's expensive depending on what you choose to use. Ebb and flow, also known as flood and drain, is really more for specialized applications. Here I'm using it in one of my systems to grow microgreens. And it does some things amazingly well, and it's much more popular in aquaponics than it is in hydroponics. And it will use either a siphon or a timer to accomplish ebb and flow. And what ebb and flow simply means is water comes in and fills up to a level. And after a time, it drains all the way back down completely out of the system. And it runs in cycles. And that cycle can be controlled by a timer. So we have a constantly running pump. And as soon as you hit your top point, you start overflowing a siphon. The siphon kicks in and drains it all the way out. Just like if you took a straw, put your thumb over it, stick it in a soda, and then you can lift it out and soda comes out. And when you take your thumb off, the soda comes out of the straw. Or you blow it at your little sister when you're a kid, right? That's a siphon. You can also use a timer. The system you're looking at here uses a time-based system. And the way it works is if you look at the bulkhead on the right, bottom right corner right there, that bulkhead is set to the about as low as it can be. The only thing the water has to do is get up over that little lip right there. And that is the, the, the orifice that the water comes in from. The water actually pumps in through that hole. The orifice to the left has a fitting in it, and that fitting, that top of that fitting right there on that rim, that sets the level of water in this system. So water pumps in here and overflows here, and that creates a level. When the timer shuts off, and I'm running this on a 15-45 cycle, 15 minutes on, 45 minutes off, at that point, what happens is, all the water goes right back out the same hole it came in. And it drains all the way back down. And what that does is, is it pushes water in and then it pulls water out. Now, what that, the reason it's so popular in aquaponics where we need air for our fish, we also need media for a nitrate-nitrite cycle that you know anybody that runs a, a fish aquarium would understand. Um, we, we're taking and we're pushing that water in. All the stale air goes out. And when the water drops, it's pulling all fresh air into the media. Well, in this case, with microgreens that are notoriously easy to overwater and you get all kinds of problems, and everybody told me I would have them here, it's, it solves the overwatering problem because it's not a water problem, it's an oxygen problem to the roots. We'll talk about that more in a bit as well. But just so it's a little you know, easier to understand what I just said, if in case anybody's confused, this is a supply line. This is bringing water in. This is a return line. It brings water to lower parts of the system. So water comes in, fills up to about right there and level, maintains that level, and it outflows here. And then when the pump stops, the water just falls right back down into the sump. And that way, there's no siphon to exist as a point of failure. Um, let's move on to some systems that I've built recently. This is my crack key seed starting system. I call it simple and effective, and I say, if anything, it works too well. And the reason that it works too well is if you start seed too far in advance of when you want to transplant it, assuming you're transplanting into something other than another hydroponic system where you can just take the cup and move the cup, if you want to actually pull it out of the cup, it grows so much roots that you end up stripping roots to get it out of the cup. I've trimmed out the cups like every other uh, line girding and trimmed the bottoms out. And the more you trim them out, the less of a problem there is. But I'm accustomed to doing things like if I'm going to start peppers or tomatoes, I'm starting those about six to eight weeks 
before I, I'm going to put them out in the garden. With this system, I need to be starting them at about 20 days to minimize the root damage of extracting them from the cups. Uh, as you can see, this system is incredibly simple. It's using a $30 rack from Amazon that you can get with a little greenhouse tarp that goes over it, the Barina lights, and it's using aluminum roasting pans, the large-sized aluminum roasting pans. It's using um, foam board, half-inch foam board, holes drilled in them, two-inch net cups, and Rapid Rooter plugs is the, the brand of plugs that I use. Um, really, really simplistic. Um, 15 per pan uh, plants uh, is about the density that, that I can plant and, and get really good growth out of them. Uh, there are some plants in the lower tray, the number three tray there, that were put in kind of second. But all of this stuff here, all this stuff here is all uh, about 26 days, I think, at the time this photograph and stuff down here as well. Um, really simple. Now, some people have warned me that these pans can eventually get pinholes in them uh, due to uh, the nutrient uh, solution. And maybe... Uh, I'm on my third run. It hasn't happened yet. What I'm going to do is just simply, they're cheap. I'm going to use two pans. So if one gets a pinhole in it, throw that one out and then make the, the outside one, the new inside one, and put one on it. Really simple. It's aluminum. It's recyclable. Uh, this is the best thing I could find off the shelf to do this with. Probably the more efficient method would be to build a box and line it with something like a pond liner, or in this case, all you really need is like uh, vapor barrier plastic, like six mil plastic, because then you could actually get more than 30 plants to a layer and still maintain the same density because you lose a little bit of density right here. But that that's, that's the most basic system that I've built so far. The lights are on a simple mechanical timer, and I run an 18-6 light cycle, 18 on, 6 off. This is what I mean about being so effective that it may be too effective. These are peppers at 26 days from seed. To me, these peppers are, they look better, they're bigger, they're happier, they're stockier, they're just more peppery, right? Than what I usually get when I buy expensive peppers at Home Depot and Lowe's. Either they're about the same height that are nowhere near as happy, or they're right big tall peppers, but they're all lanky and skinny and they don't have any muscle, so to say. Um, these are anchos and uh, marconis and I think New Mexico peppers. Um, all I did with these is just take a rapid rooter, drop it into that system, water filled up to, you know, uh, just about an inch from the top of the cup and drop the seed in the rapid rooter, walked away. 26 days later, this is what we have. Moving on, this is basil 26 days from seed. Basil is not really a fast grower uh, in most people's minds. And... I actually took one of these plants out because I think that it's hard to even get your head around looking into the 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 rack how how large those basil plants are. And again, if you look at the uh, the root mass there, and you can see in these cups, I've actually, as I said, I've cut out uh, quite a bit of the net cup support, and that lets those roots come out. But even in this situation, you're probably going to strip some roots. Now I've had no problems transplanting, even with some root being pulled off of the plants. But I'm, I'm back to, I think most plants, not all, but most plants in this system will probably do uh, at about 18 to 20 days is, is where you need to plan your transplant if you're going into a soil-based system with them. Um, this is arugula 26 days from seed. You might as well eat this. I mean, this is, this is big baby arugula at this point. And we do eat a lot of, uh, a lot of the stuff out of the seed starting system because I've been playing with lettuces and stuff like that right now. And it's, it, again, as you can see, it just has a really uh, rapid growth. This is the tomato that you saw earlier. I, I, what I wanted to do, to do, though, was get a little bit closer on this one for you. You can see the leaves did get a little curl. That's because the plant grew so damn fast it got up against the lights. Those were actually in contact with the lights uh, on that system. But it's got blossoms. If you look down there where my finger is, 25 days from seed, and a tomato plant has flowers on it. That would, if this would have been in the summertime and I put this out, those it would have set fruit probably 35 days after you planted it from seed before most people are putting them out. Now, whether you use this for seed starting or not, I'm just kind of pointing out the growth rate that we're able to obtain with Crack Key Hydroponics. And just another shot of me holding those tomatoes to give you an idea about the root systems that came out of them. I'll, I regret to inform you these two tomatoes died because I grew them in December and January. 
and I just really didn't have a place for them. But before I relied on this system to do my spring starting, I wanted to make sure they worked, and boy, boy, do they do. This is Yod Fa at 26 days. This is a type of Chinese broccoli or Chinese kale. Um, I put this in here because think about broccoli, kale, uh, cauliflower, any of your, your crops like a cabbage, you have about a, a three-week at the maximum lead time to start seed indoors to put them out with this system. Uh, that is plenty big enough to be transplanting broccoli plants. It sure looks better than the six packs I buy in box stores. Well, what happened is I built this thing and I'm like, holy crap, what do I do with all this stuff? It's winter, it's cold, and I've been really doing a lot of research on vertical farms. And I'm like, I, I don't have enough outdoor protected space to be growing all this stuff outside in the winter. And it's cold out there and I don't like it. I don't like being cold and I don't like getting rained on. I like to garden from like March through the fall. So I decided, why don't you try to build a vertical farm for indoor growth? And my original plan was to put this upstairs where the seed starting system is. And when I, and when I realized that, well, I'm going to have to take it apart in about a month and a half and take it down to Belton, Texas. Um, I don't want to have to drag it down the stairs and all that stuff. It's a pretty sizable system, what have you. Um, so I bet, built it out in my garage. So my growth rates have been a little slower because it's been like 45, 50 degrees in the garage on a good day. Uh, this January. So I still have had great rates of growth. And I have all the lights turned off in these pictures so that the red light doesn't kind of ruin the photography for you. Uh, but the way I designed this system is it's designed to produce 10 to 15 plants to full harvest a week. So you can start 10 to 15 plants every week and you can completely remove 10 to 15 plants every week and take your starts and then transplant them from the little crack key tray that's down there at the bottom that's built out of a simple seven gallon rubbermaid tub that you can get for uh or not it's a, actually a, for mixing concrete home depot and low sell these things are about six bucks a piece uh so you start your plants down here and you transplant them up as they grow out all right uh it can also do four to eight half trays of microgreens a week with ebb and flow that's the top tray up here it uses, uh, again, crack key for seed starting, and it's really a hybrid deep water crack key for grow out. And I'll, I'll show you in a second how we do that, but these two trays here that are your main grow out trays for your main crops, they simply have a, 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 a board that's actually the plastic corrugated plastic material for making outdoor signs. I went to that instead of foam board because it, it lasts longer and it works better and it costs less in the end. Um, and then they're suspended by some flower pots that create that air gap we talked about. So even though 15 minutes out of every hour, water is circulating through this system. It's being pumped out of the sump down here, which is a simple 17-gallon uh, Commander uh, brand Rubbermaid tub. You can use anything that fits. This just happens to fit really nice. Water pumps up into the tray here for ebb and flow. It overflows the tray during that cycle, and it flows through here. And it drops down here, and it drops back in the sump. It's as simple as it could be. It's using a cheap $50 pump that you can buy at Home Depot or Lowe's or on Amazon. And it's on a $10 mechanical timer for the pump. And it's on a $10 mechanical timer for uh, the, the lights. All in, this system is about $700. Bucks. That's a top high-end uh, rack. It's a 24-inch deep rack because it just looks nicer and works better. Uh, if you're at the at the expo, or if you had made the expo, you can come by the booth and actually see this, put your hands on it, and touch it. But the 18-inch wide racks cost a lot less money, and while the trays will hang over, these trays are built to be, have enough structural integrity to hang over. No problem, no foul. Um, Four-foot Barina lights, three to each layer here, two for the microgreens on the top, two-foot Barina lights, three down here on that tray. That's pretty much the entire system. You might really want to consider getting your rack with some casters so you can move it around. That's been very, very valuable to us. Um, this is how we combine deep water and cracky, as I was saying. So you can see these plants here are growing out. They're about 25 to 35 days, depending on which plants we're looking at here, of growth. You can see some cheap flower pots. These things are like $1.80 a piece or something like that. I use six per layer. And I took the corrugated plastic material. And you can see right there, maybe right there, the water level is about right there on that flower pot. So when, when that cover is put back down, your roots are probably about right there is where your water level is on those roots. 
So we have all of that air gap in there, and you can see plants that have been a little longer, the root mass that they've formed. But yet we're getting the benefit of the flowing water through the system to maintain oxygen and also to help keep the nutrient solution dissolved. Every time that pump kicks on, it's recirculating and it is mixing the solution. Um, here's you know, typical growth. Most of this is different lettuces at 25 to 35 days. Most of these, honestly, are at about 35 days of growth. This is at a point where, in a system with this much density, it's, it's this close together, it's probably a good idea for some of these plants here to actually just be harvested in full and to bring new plants in for grow out. Again, you should be able to harvest at least 10 plants a week. If we value them at $3 a plant, that's $30 in, 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 in produce without counting the microgreens and without counting the fact that we can do a lot of cut and come again cutting here as well. Um, these plants are more at your like your 25 day rate. Uh, this plant right here is actually really interesting. This is called Celtus. And this is a lettuce, but it really isn't a lettuce. It's, it grows a stem. Some people call it asparagus lettuce. It's out of the Far East and uh, kind of a, a plant well known by the Chinese. It was originally brought to America by Atlee Burpee Company in the 50s. And it was going to be a big deal and it just didn't catch on. Um, in hydro, I have yet to produce a stem. Usually by the time the plants are this big, if they're planted in soil, that stem's starting to grow. So maybe that plant needs a little bit of stress, and it's just not stressed at all in this situation. But it's a damn good lettuce, and as you can see, at 25 days, it's, it's absolutely at a, a size for harvest. Um, these little plants here are Swiss chard. You can see that in the cold garage, they're not growing as fast. Generally, by 25 days, the Swiss chard, if grown indoors, is significantly larger, about twice the size of that. Um, here's some uh, purple pak choy. Man, I love this stuff. And that's 25 days old. That plant's exactly 25 days old in that picture, as is the basil in the foreground. And, um, you know, it's probably at a size where I want it to get a little bit bigger before we cook it, but it certainly could be harvested. And you see arugula uh, to the rear. That arugula is a wasabi arugula. That's at 25 days as well. Uh, ebb and flow microgreens. So this was an interesting thing. That, I talked about that cycle. 15 minutes on, 45 minutes off. Everybody that was helping out as best they could as I was putting this together on YouTube screamed at me, you kill your microgreens. You can't do this. Oh, my God, no. And um, I was coming up with a way to maybe have two pumps and only water the microgreens twice a day for only a couple minutes. Uh, all these different opinions. And I realized something about where these opinions were coming from. They were coming from people who meant well, that knew a lot about microgreens, and almost every single one of them was growing microgreens in soil. I wasn't growing microgreens in soil. I grow microgreens on a jute mat. And the way ebb and flow works, as I explained earlier, is that water comes in, it pushes stale air out, and when the water level drops, it pulls fresh air in. Meaning that actually the more cycles you run, the more oxygen the roots get. So I decided the hell with everybody... And I turned it to a 1545 cycle and I'm running it 12 or 24 hours a day like that, every hour. And this has been my results. That's borage. If you have never grown borage microgreens, you need to grow borage microgreens. I went to half trays. These are what you call a 1010 versus a 1020 tray. And I did that because I realized like a 1020 tray of microgreens for a single household is a lot of microgreens. So we grow three or four varieties of microgreens at a time. We eat as much as we can, and then we go ahead and we give those to the birds. You'll get in a 10-10 tray, when you fully grow out, borage, radish, sunflower, garden cress, etc., about a half pound to a 10-10 tray. Uh, when you go to a retail package for microgreens, it'll sell for around 6 to 8 bucks, depending on what you're buying. You usually get about 2 ounces. So let's just say it's 6 bucks to two ounces and with a half pound you've got four ounces right so you i'm sorry you got four two ounce servings so each tray's worth about 24 bucks at low cost retail versus you know not considering what high-end chefs pay for this stuff in, in restaurants and buy it by the ounce or whatever so there's a there's a huge economic yield in high quality high nutrient dense greens at, at the top of this system um before I get into the nutrient, the two different nutrients I've been using and how to use them, I want to kind of go back and talk about 
nutrient density. And one of the myths about hydroponics is the food's not as nutrient dense as soil grown food. This is preposterous. And the reason it's preposterous is plants take the nutrient they want if the nutrient is available to them. That's just a constant. And they don't take up things that they don't want unless you have water that's, let's say, acidic enough to force them to. So if we make a nutrient available in a hydro system, plants are going to take up exactly as much nutrient as they want. And if we use a balanced nutrient solution, whether it's organic or synthetic, in the end, a molecule is a molecule. There's some things I don't like about synthetic fertilizer. I won't deny that. But in the end, a molecule of nitrogen or a molecule of selenium is a molecule of nitrogen or selenium. And when you look at a plant that looks as happy and healthy as the, the, these microgreens do, as th these plants here do, these plants are not deficient in nutrient. They, they, they would not be this happy nor this healthy if they were deficient in nutrient. The main reason that we have nutrient deficient plants uh, it, it, that we're consuming in grocery stores is farmers don't get paid for flavor and they want something that will transport long distance and then they do it. When we're taking a plant that's been harvested this minute and consumed within the next hour, we're having almost no loss of nutrient. So we have very nutrient-dense food in our hydroponic systems. And taste and flavor is far more a component of how fresh the food is and the varieties that we're growing. And since we're doing this in home scale and we're not shipping it from California to Pittsburgh, we can harvest literally minutes before we eat, especially with an indoor system. Now, on the nutrient choices, I really recommend most people start out with Master Blend uh, because everybody knows how to use this. You can find the recipe in five seconds on YouTube with people showing you how to do it. A lot of people do make a concentrate out of it. I have found that to just be not worth doing. But here's the thing. It's cheap. The recipe's known and it works. There, there's some there's some real greatness in that. And the way I mix it, I mix it four gallons at a time in a five-gallon bucket. And the reason is you, you can't do five gallons and you can do four at a time. I take a mortar mixer. It looks like a big egg beater and a cordless drill. And I add the calcium nitrate first, and I dissolve it. And then I add the 41838 and the Epsom salt second. Why? Calcium nitrate is the harder one to get to dissolve. But with that mixer, it dissolves just fine. And again, you can look up the recipe. I'll include a document with this uh, USB version uh, so that you can look it up. I'll have it. At doing a run through here, I've realized that I don't have the recipe. But there's two recipes. And one is for vegetative growth, and the other one is for flowering and fruiting. For what we're doing with indoor production, if we're not doing tomatoes and peppers and stuff like that, we only need the first one because we're harvesting that lettuce plant somewhere around 30 to 35 days. And it's as much as it needs to grow beautifully that way. I love that this stuff is cheap, too, because with a package that is you know a 25-pound pack, which is going to be 5 pounds of... Uh, I'm sorry, 10 pounds of the 418 and, and, and 10 pounds of the 15-0, along with uh, f uh, 5 pounds of Epsom salts. I mean, you can grow food for years at the scale we're talking about. So as a prepper, yeah, I'm good with that one package for years of being able to produce my own food. And there's some value to that. It's cheap also because there's no weight to it, really, other than the solids. So it's cheap to ship compared to a liquid product. Of the liquid products I've tried, the one I like the most has come to me from a listener recommending it, and it's made by Urban Farm Company, Urban Farm Fertilizer Company. It's Texas Tomato Food. It is partially organic. It does use some conventional NPK in it, but it also uses things like bat guano. It's got microorganisms in it, and it works really good. Some of the plants you saw were grown with this. Some were grown with the Master Blend. There's not a huge difference in the taste or growth rate, though. They both seem to work about the same. Uh, I do believe using this has made the system more bioactive, and it's probably why I've ended up with worms in my system, honestly. Where they come from, I don't know. It dissolves easily, and it's convenient. It's more expensive because it's pre-mixed. Uh, this company actually brews it every week to order. Like, they're going to ship 
100,000 gallons or 10,000 gallons or whatever, they make that much every week so that it's always fresh. Um, and it is more expensive, but we pay for convenience all the time in our world. So what you're paying for with this is convenience. It's really easy to mix. You measure out how much you're going to use, and, and you're good to go. Um, let's make the complicated simple. Uh, I bought all kinds of information on this, and I started to feel like my wife felt about gardening before she met me, that it wasn't worth doing. Well, you got to test the soil. This used to tell me what, well, here's why I don't want to garden. First, you have to test the soil, and then you have to see what the pH is, and then you have to adjust it. I'm like, I don't do any of that crap. I put lots of organic matter on, I plant stuff. She's like, you can just do that? I'm like, yeah. That's what when you read too much and do too little. So, to me, if you have a way to catch rainwater, use rainwater. You're going to start out with water that has almost no dissolved solids in it. It's going to be about a zero. My rainwater off my roof, I end up with like uh, three parts per million of, of, of dissolved solids. And you're going to end up with water that it tends toward the acid, and you want your system toward the acidic. If your pH is 6 to 7, relax. It's going to be fine for most things. If you get to certain specialized things, you might want to get more into fine-tuning it. Instead of foam board, like you see in this picture here, use the corrugated plastic sign material. You can get it at Home Depot, Lowe's, etc. You can buy four foot by eight foot sheets. You cut it with a razor knife. It lasts forever. It's designed to get wet. It's designed to deal with UV light. It's cheap. It's light. It's easy to work with. When you are growing your plants, and I am new to this, and I admit that, if you're growing in that first stage of growth, Shoot for a part per million of about 500 to 600 parts per million of dissolved solid. Test it with an EC meter you can buy for 10 bucks from Amazon. And that's your initial reading. It's going to fluctuate and change over time, but it's not that big a deal with these lower, uh, fast turn crops like lettuce and leaf crops and, and herbs. Use a mortar mixer and a drill to mix your nutrient, especially if you're using solids. And as you can see, my results show it really, really is not that complicated. It just isn't. Let me talk about the pH for a second, how important everybody makes this out to be. I have watched people do tests and go from very acidic to very alkaline on YouTube and do really good controlled grows side by side. It grows like lettuces and plants like that. They grow almost no matter what they grow. They definitely grow bigger and healthier if you're slightly acidic than if you're heavily acidic or alkaline. So six to seven, relax. It's probably fine. I will tell you that I haven't even bothered testing the pH. I know that my rainwater's in the sixes. And I know that when we use something like the Texas tomato food, or we use something with an Epsom salt, then we're going to drive that pH down a little bit. So I'm estimating my starting pH is going to be somewhere between 6.2 and 6.6. And I don't worry about it. I don't worry about it. Now, some of the systems I plan to build in the future, I may put some more thought into that, longer-term crops, etc. And again, this is where things like Kratky and deep water are very forgiving compared to something like nutrient film. And that's another reason I recommend that's kind of where you start. Here's my future plans. Number one, I want to fine-tune and perfect the vertical farm. Uh, I want to fine-tune and perfect the seed system. And then I want to do some outside stuff. I'm, I'm working right now on design for a large-scale greenhouse system and a deep water tomato system. If listening to all this, though, you're still thinking, but it's not really an organic. It's not a life-based system, you know, and there is some bad to it. And there is. My goal long-term is to develop an all-organic system, all-organic hydroponics. People say it can't do it. There's problems with it, blah, 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 blah. The solution is to not get hung up on hydro versus aquaponics. If you want to say anything, I would call my system basically a worm ponics system. If we derive our nitrogen from a nitrite nitrate cycle, then our battle's half one right there. It really is. So what we need is media, and we need water to move against that media. So an ebb and flow system that is then fertilized with things like fish food and then able to break down. And we can accelerate that breakdown with worms. And as the worms produce what we call worm juice, there's a lot of mineral to that. And the systems that I've seen that work well, they're using mostly worm juice and worm fertilizer and worm castings in them 
to get them to work. Well, if we just house the worms in an ebb and flow bed at the top of the system, it's automated. It's done. And if we put food on top of the, the, uh, the media, when the lights go out or the sun goes down, the worms come up and eat it, they do their thing. If you feed about a half a pound of food a day, you'll have about a half a pound of worms in your system. That's, they just kind of maintain themselves at that. And so that's the system I'm looking at. And I'm thinking about doing a large scale outside, but even the system I showed you, the vertical farm, if we went to just doing four tray, four half trays of microgreens, we could fill the rest of that tray with media. We could take four trays and sit them into that media so that our, our, our trays that we're growing in could just kind of drop into those and pull out of those. And we could have enough media up there to, to run a system like that. Now, it's going to take some time to figure out. And unlike a fish-based system, as long as we're not using something like copper that kills invertebrates, we can add the same types of nutrients we need in a, a hydro system without really worrying about killing our worms. We're not going to kill our worms because we add some calcium or magnesium or iron or zinc to that system. They're going to be just fine. So we can supplement those with a chelated liquid mineral nutrient, and we don't have to worry about fish dying. We don't have to, worms are a lot more resilient than fish, and I just think that that system eventually will work. Here's some key resources, contact information for me. Most of y'all watching this probably already know this information anyway. Uh, you can pause it if you want to, uh, to get more information. And, and we'll wrap up there, and, and for the actual thing, we'll be taking questions. If you've watched this and have a question I didn't answer, you can email me. You can see the email address. It's probably easy to figure out, even though it's not on there. I should put it there. But it's jack at the survivalpodcast.com.